Okay, you're live. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, great, for the sake of the camera, this is San Francisco PHP Meetup Group. Uh, we're here tonight at Big Commerce. Uh, thanks to Steve, he's going to be giving a great talk on the why of performance. Um, we have a lot of great uh, sponsors this month, um, and just in general now. Uh, we have Big Commerce for tonight, Steve's time, which is awesome. Um, we have App Dynamics. They're uh, sponsoring some performance monitoring and error logging type stuff for us with the new website coming up. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, we have Engine Yard who gave us a nice logo. I don't know if you've seen the stickers over here on the side by the desserts, but we got stickers, uh, new logo. We'll be having uh, some more fun stuff coming soon, uh, t-shirts and so on. So that's really exciting. Uh, hopefully our own elephant as well. Uh, PHP Storm, we have licenses to raffle off. Though with Jacob gone, I can't remember how to get the licenses. So uh, we're going to skip the raffle of those this month, but we do have their yo-yos. Um, we have uh, some t-shirts, thanks to uh, Code Academy. Uh, we have, um, oh, I can't remember the name. They're going to kill me. Um, hold on. I got to look. Sorry. Oof. What's their name? Pluralsight. Pluralsight, uh, some educational materials. Uh, they're raffling off some stuff. The little sign you saw downstairs, that's thanks to Zen. Um, so they give us that. Um, so a lot of companies are starting to sponsor stuff for us. So it's pretty cool, a lot of stuff out there. Um, the big announcement, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff on the mailing list or on the Twitter feed, but we are working on a uh, new website. Uh, we still want to use meetup.com. Uh, they're still going to be the primary data source, but we are working on uh, some different views into their data. Make it a little bit easier to highlight the videos, uh, highlight the speakers, um, make it easier to find new events, uh, upcoming events, as well as uh, potentially related events and materials from uh, the different talks. Um, it's all open source, github.com slash sfphp. Um, so a big thanks to Tom. Uh, he has done a ton of work on that site. Um, so we're very appreciative to him. Um, but if anyone else wants to participate, grab it, fork it, write some stuff, create some issues, whatever. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have a beta up of it. Um, so we'll be able to start playing around with that soon. Upcoming events, I don't believe we've booked January yet, but um, in January or February, uh, we will have uh, Dustin uh, Whittle, he'll be talking again. Um, I can't remember the topic, sorry. Jacob's the one that organized it and he's back to his new family, so uh, <laughs> I can't remember. Um, beyond that, is that everybody sponsor-wise? I think so. Um, do the normal show of hands of people who are looking to hire someone. Anybody looking to hire? All right. So <laughs> instead of you know, going the other way, so anybody who's looking to be hired, those are the people to find. So raise your hands again. All right. So those are the few, I guess. So only those two are still hiring. I don't know what happened to everybody else. <laughs> Um, but just quick, um, anybody have a couple of second announcement, upcoming community events or anything of that nature? All right, great. Well, in that case, I'll turn it over to Steve and here we go. Thank you. Oh, cell phone's off too, by the way. Sorry. Do you guys think I need a mic or is this loud enough? Mike, raise your hand if you want me to have a mic. The question is whether or not the video camera needs a mic. No, the video camera's coming right off the uh, webcam here, so. All right. I don't like the mic because I always mess it up. Like go up here and then you'll get the nasty noise and you'll hate me. So no mic it is. All right. Oh, by the way, I want to mention too that with the raffle, uh, I'm gonna give out. I have a book that I wrote called Scaling PHP. I'm gonna throw in three copies of it in the raffle. It's an ebook, so I don't have anything like tangible to give you. But we can pretend that I'm like giving you the gift of knowledge or something like that. <laughs> um, so the talk tonight is called uh, The Why of Performance. And um, this talk is a, is a little weird to me because I talk a lot about performance and scaling and all these like really complicated ways to make your code run faster and to make it more scalable. And I wanted to take a step back and think about like why is that important? Why is performance actually important? Like I know it's important. We all know like it's important, but why? Why is it important? And you're like, well, you know, I want code to go faster. And that's like it's not a good reason actually. Like, why is performance important? When does it matter? And maybe sometimes it doesn't actually matter. 
um, but you know, don't shoot me. By the way, I also showed this talk to a coworker that works here, and he's like an ops guy, he's like a systems guy, and it really offended him at the core, this talk, so I think it'll be interesting. I think maybe you'll, you'll either like it or you'll, you'll hate it. We'll see how it goes. So I'm gonna start with a bold statement, and I'm gonna say that performance doesn't actually matter. Like, the more I thought about it, I'm like, why is performance important? And performance for the sake of important, performance for the sake of performance isn't actually important, right? It, it, it's kind of a waste of, a, of time a lot of times. Like, it's not actually getting us something unless there's something we need from performance, right? So when you think about performance, I'm like, all right, so I made this bold statement, but you know, sometimes it does matter. Like, there are times when performance does matter. But why? Why is, like, I want to boil it down and figure out why it's important. So I'm like, well, like, performance is really just making your code faster, right? Like, that's, that's performance, but that still doesn't answer the question. So, like, you just do this and then you're done. And I was thinking about this, and uh, it reminded me of the story that I read a long time ago. It just, like, popped back in, into my head. And I was on uh, this website. I don't know if anyone reads it. It's called The Daily WTF. Does anyone read that? Right. So it stands for The Daily What the Fuck. And uh, it's like a programming website, and every day they post like these crazy, outrageous, but true stories about like WTF situations <clears throat> that people ran into at work. Like just stupid programming situations where you're banging your head against the keyboard, and you're like, why does this even exist? Why does, who wrote this awful code? And it reminded me of this story, and you can Google it, it's called uh, The Speed Up Loop. And this made me think about performance. And the story of the speed up loop goes, there's this guy named Ben, and he goes into a new job for an interview, and uh, he meets with the guy, Wayne, and Wayne's a senior guy, and Wayne is like, listen, we don't really need you, but we, we lost the consultant, and you know how it is, we need to hire someone else and fill a spot, so we don't have that much work, but hey, whatever, like, come join the team. And so after the interview, Ben is like, all right, yeah, that sounds pretty awful, but I'll try it out, I'll, I'll start there. And so Ben starts with a new job, and he's going through the code, and he finds the speed up loop. And he's like, well, what, is, what is this code here for? Is it a bug? It doesn't do anything. It just loops over this huge number, and it's just thrown in random places, like random important screens in the app. And he's like, what, what is this? Why is it this? Who wrote this? So he goes to, Ben goes to Wayne, and he's like, hey, Wayne, like, do you see this crazy bug I found? And Wayne's like, no, no, Ben, Ben, that's the speed up loop. This is, think of it as an insurance policy. If, <coughs> if we have a slow week, you know, we don't get much done, we just go in here and we delete a zero off the end of the loop and we say, go to management and we say, oh, we really didn't get you know, a lot done this week. We, had, we ran into a lot of problems, but we did some crazy engineering magic and even though we didn't deliver any features, we made the app 10 times faster. <laughs> So we could end here, right? Like, if we want performance, all we do is go to work tomorrow, and we remove a zero from our speed up loop. By the way, um, Ben or Wayne also taught Ben about uh, estimation in IT, and, and, and Wayne believes that uh, nothing in IT actually ever takes more than 80 hours of work. This is the 80-20 rule, by the way. Sorry, I messed up the show. It's the 80-20 rule of IT, and it's that nothing in engineering ever takes more than 80 hours of work but you always multiply your estimates by 20 times when you give them to your boss. Wayne has a lot of insight, but the speed of loop, I think, is the key <clears throat> takeaway. So back to performance, though. Obviously, this is not performance. We don't have speed of loops in our code that we can just go tweak. Um, and I'm thinking, well, we're building things in PHP. At least I'm assuming everyone here is building things in PHP, probably web apps. I'm like, well, if you're building a web app, your definition of performance is actually very different than what someone else's definition of performance may be. If you're a game developer, or you're writing code for your Toyota Prius, or um, you know, whatever, however you're writing code, your definition of performance is very different. It doesn't mean the same thing across different domains. And specifically web apps, I want to dig in more. What does performance mean? What what actually is it about? And so then. I came to this conclusion. Well, it's it's really about what scale are you working at? And I don't mean like scale in the traditional sense of scaling your application to a bajillion users. I mean like what's the scale of your domain? What level of performance is important? What do you need to target for your level of performance? Is when you're building a PHP app, does force milliseconds matter? Probably not. 
Does 10 seconds matter? Probably, right? It impacts user experience. What about one second? What about half a second? What about 0.1 second? You know, what, where are the lines and where are the boundaries of building a web app where performance is actually important, where it actually matters? Some more research. And I wanted to know, well, how fast is like the mean uh, website load time? And any guesses? This is from this number is from 2012, so maybe it's faster now. But any guesses? What would it be? Two Five. seconds. Two seconds. Five seconds. Five seconds. One second. Three seconds. Three seconds. Oh, All right. With one second. <laughs> Ten seconds. Hundred milliseconds. Anyone else want to go high or low? It's seven seconds. Again, 2012, but it's probably still relatively re realistic, right? You load like even Amazon. The, the biggest retailer in the world, like it takes a long time on my brand new MacBook Pro or whatever to load pretty to in load speed and buy something. So that's that's at least gives us gives us an upper end. Like seven seconds is probably the worst experience we want to put our users through when we build a, a web app, when we build something. We probably don't want it to, to take longer than that. I'd imagine most of us, since we, we care about Programming, we want it to be much faster than that. But it's, we have an upper boundary, right? Our upper boundary of performance, we can say, is seven seconds. I'd even do one better and say, well, actually, seven seconds is probably not good enough. We want to keep our jobs, right? Unless you work at some big enterprise where they just don't care about performance at all. If you, especially if you work at a startup or some company that's very you know, web focused, you probably want to do better than seven seconds. This, I think the transition is out of order here. But, 500 milliseconds. I think in my head, I'm like, 500 milliseconds is probably the upper boundary of when my PHPF gets a request, I want to give data back to the client in less than 500 milliseconds. I think it's a, probably you can do better than that, you should do better than that, but it's a reasonable upper bound of, this is how the maximum time something should take, and if it's higher than this, I'm doing something wrong, right? Seven seconds, by the way, not even close. Okay. So, and then by the way, like, that's a lot of time. I'm thinking about it, I'm like, 500 milliseconds in a, in a computer is, is quite a lot of time, right? Game developers that are doing a 60 frame per second game have 16 milliseconds to render each frame, right? If you do 60 frames per second, one second divided by 60, you end up with 16 milliseconds. And that, that's actually a real constraint. 500 milliseconds, you could do a lot in 500 milliseconds if you could render a frame for like a, triple A game or whatever in 16 milliseconds. So that led me down the path. What can we do in 500 milliseconds? And if you look at a modern CPU, right, uh, three gigahertz Intel Core i7, the best of, you know that's out there right now, it's three gigahertz. And that basically means that it can do three billion CPU cycles per second. Well, so if we have 500 milliseconds, we have one and a half billion CPU cycles that we can basically burn to generate a web request, okay? So well, what can we do in one and a half billion CPU cycles? That's a lot of freaking CPU cycles, right? Can't count that high, it's crazy. We can do a lot. So when we think about building a web application, we start to drill down, well, we have 500 milliseconds, and well, then it probably means that doing some crazy optimization where we save 100 nanoseconds here or there, doing some nasty code just to get a little bit faster performance, probably starts to matter less and less. So in 500 milliseconds, we need to quantify that more. We need to know, this is kind of hard to see, but these are latency numbers that every programmer should know. And so this left side shows different L1 cache reference, branch, branch uh, mispredict, L2 cache reference, and you can kind of see how this big block equals one of these blue blocks, and over here it's you know reading something from memory is one of these blue blocks, and green block up at the top is sending a kilobyte over a gigabit network, all the way to reading from a hard drive and sending a packet from California to the Netherlands, right? So kind of you can see as you do these things over here, it takes much, much longer time. And you're like, well, what the hell is a nanosecond anyways? Why do I care about that? And I found a really interesting uh, kind of way to describe this. And if you multiply all of these numbers by a billion, and we say, well, this little thing up here, this uh, L1 cache reference, which, which takes half a nanosecond, if that actually took half a second, okay? So we pretend this little block means half a second in your CPU, then when you read something out of memory, it would take two minutes. 
And if you read some piece of data from an SSD, it takes a day and a half. And reading something from a hard drive, seven and a half months. And if you want to send a packet from California to the Netherlands, over there it's 150 milliseconds, but with the scale, it would take about five years. So going from the most micro bit, micro piece of an L1 cache reference, taking half of a second, to taking five years to read, to send a packet round trip from California to the Netherlands. Five years, by the way, is about as long as it takes to fly to Mars and back round trip. So half a second to flying to Mars round trip and back. That's the difference between pulling data from your L1 cache in your processor to going over the network to you know, different content. That really put performance in perspective for me, though. It's like, well, I have 500 milliseconds. I could either send like two and a half packets to the Netherlands, or I can do a hell of a lot of L1 cache references, or I can read a bunch of stuff from my SSD or less stuff from my hard drive. So it kind of starts to shape the perspective of what does performance actually mean? Now, is this stuff very meaningful when we're building a web app? Probably not, right? Because like PHP, actually like the things you do in PHP don't necessarily convert very well to the, the different things in here. Like we're not like, oh yeah, I did this, I pulled this thing out from my array in PHP and it was an L2 cache reference, so no big deal, it was pretty fast, but not fast. We don't control that level. So the, the things on the right tend to matter more when we're building web apps. The things on the left, they really don't matter as much because those levels of details are not necessarily exposed to us directly as PHP programmers. So then I'm like, well, what are things that actually matter when we build a PHP application, a web application. What, do, is it the L1 cache references that matter? Is it the going over the network? Is it reading from the hard drive? What are the pieces that matter? And maybe they're a little high, higher level than, than that, that chart. So I came up with the, this list of four things, right? Talking over the network matters. That means, you know, we all know this is obvious. We talk to an API, that matters. That's, we have to be critical of how many times we do that in a web application. Same thing, that's basically still talking to the database, right? Because we're going over the network, that's gonna be slow, plus that overhead talking to a database adds, right? It's databases and API in a lot of ways. And then I was like, well, thinking about it, I'm like, well, locking kind of matters too. And you're like, what? Why would locking matter? Because PHP is like this single threaded thing, it runs in a process, you can't like create a bunch of threads or whatever, but actually, web apps are very parallel, like just because one request comes in and that's a single kind of isolated thread or processor, so to speak, but you, you have lots of web requests happening at the same time, serving up different requests and you have JavaScript that's running and making Ajax requests. Like web in its nature is very, very parallel. It's very concurrent. Even if you're serving lots of different people or you're just serving a single request, like it's not just one request like input output. It's like there's all these other moving pieces. In fact, I argue that it's more complicated than doing like true multi-threading in like C++ or something because you have all of these variables, these threads, so to speak, that are running that you don't necessarily control, right? You don't control if your user in your browser clicks something and fires off an Ajax request that causes a web request in PHP to run. You don't know when that's happening. You don't know that all the timing specifics. You don't really control that. So we have to think about locking. Like if you write to a file in your PHP process, you need to be very aware of how that's, how you're locking that, if you're unlocking it, you know, because there's all these other things happening that you don't control directly. And then I'm like, well, there's the traditional things, data structures, and do those matter in PHP? And I'm like, well, they kind of do, but if you're at such a higher level language that unless you're dealing with lots of, lots of data in a certain web request, they don't really matter that much. And even things that you'd expect to be kind of obvious, like arrays in PHP should actually be faster than objects or something, is actually not true, right? There's like these, because we're not using a systems language, there's all these things that don't meet your expectations. Objects in PHP are faster than arrays, PHP arrays. Algorithms as well, like if you're building a web, you're probably not dealing with a, a big data scenario where you're processing big data with your PHP app, and maybe algorithms don't actually matter that much. It's more about talking over the network and locking and then just doing work, right? There's, maybe that falls into these two, but I'm not sure. Like, it's not your traditional performance where your traditional computer scientist is like, hey, we need to use a different data structure. Hey, we have, you know, we're using an O n squared algorithm. We need to use an O n to the n algorithm. Like, it does, it, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit disconnected or a higher layer than traditional computer science performance and optimization and, and tuning and that sort of thing. 
So what's the root of all evil in programming? Anyone know root of all evil? Premature. Premature optimization. I hate that. It makes me groan. The root of all evil is premature optimization. It makes me groan. And you're like, premature optimization? Of course I don't do that. I'm, I'm a good programmer. Like, it's the rest of these idiots that are doing that, but it's not me. It's definitely not me. I'm like, yeah, I feel that way too. And I'm thinking, well, what does premature optimization actually mean? Because no one does it, but yet it's everywhere in our code we look at. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's, it's gross. So I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, well, premature optimization really means optimizing as you go which is the wrong way to optimize. Optimizing as you go means that you're writing your code and you're like, oh man, you know what, this part's probably going to be slow. This is, there's going to be a lot of data flowing through this part. So I better, you know, I'm using an array here, but I better just like do something else, do something crazy. And it, when you optimize as you go, you end up writing um, code that is, is at a lower level than what you need it to be because you're thinking ahead. You're thinking that this part is going to be the part that needs to be optimized. And that's what premature optimization is. And I stumbled upon this quote by Alan Kay, and it says, he said, Alan said, I don't know him personally, but I'm assuming he would want to go by Alan. Mr. Kay said, uh, make it work, make it correct, make it fast, and make it cheap. So if we go by what he said, we don't optimize anything until step three, right? We need to have the solution. We need to make sure it's the right solution, verify the thing that we've created, and then we can make it fast, and then we can, we can worry about how much it costs to make this thing. So the idea is that you code first and you optimize later, because truth is, we're all human. We don't know where the hell the hot spots of our code are gonna be. In fact, it could be a hot spot because of a totally different reason, a non-engineering reason. It could be a hotspot because someone's hot linking to this page and it's getting a lot of traffic. Even though that's the most efficient algorithm, because it's getting a lot of traffic, that's the hotspot now. The actual code or algorithms, I don't think they really matter until they matter, until you're like, oh yeah, that's the hotspot. So, what? Someone's standing up over there. Get down. <laughs> um, so anyways, a, a while back, uh, this, led me, this led me to thinking, a while back, um, I worked at a startup, uh, and, and we were building this, like, uh, this timeline system. It was similar to Twitter in a way where you can broadcast something and it got sent out to a lot of people. That was the <clears throat> essential problem that we were solving. And, and you know, we could have used like MySQL and Redis or something. Instead of doing that, I was like, no, no. This is going to be, there's going to be a lot of data in this system. We cannot use MySQL, obviously. Like, who doesn't know that? We need to use a NoSQL database. OK, great. So we, we went and we set up a Cassandra cluster, and we built this massively complicated system. And it took four months longer than we thought it was going to take. And it cost $300,000 more than it should have cost. And we launched it. We were like, yeah, this is ready. This thing is going to scale like nobody's business. We can handle a million users, maybe even 10 million. Who knows? but we are ready for success. We launched it, and we got a couple of users. <laughs> 2,000, 3,000. It was successful as like a, you launch something, you're like, awesome, 3,000 people are using my thing. That's pretty cool. But we spent half a quarter million dollars building something for millions of people when a couple thousand used it. We over-engineered it because we prematurely optimized the problem. We worried about this part first, instead of these two parts. We should have built it with MySQL. We should have launched it and verified the concept that the hotspots that we thought existed were actually there. And then we should have made it fast. We should have worried about it at that point. We also didn't do this thing very well easier either. We only focused on this. We made it expensive, but we made it fast. So the takeaway, I guess, is to not do that, right? To build it the easy way first and figure out what your hotspots are later. Don't figure them out while you're coding, while you're typing, because truth is, you don't know. And you might be right that you're not using the most efficient way to do something, but you're using the most clear and easy to read and easy to understand way to do something. So more about premature optimization. I like this phrase. I don't know if I coined it or if I read it, so I'm not sure. 
You know how you read a lot of stuff and you're like, I don't know if that's mine or someone else's. It's probably someone else's. But evidence-based optimization. And what that means is instead of prematurely optimizing, instead of optimizing as you go, you only optimize when you have evidence that the thing that you need to optimize or the thing that you need to change is actually broken. You have pure concrete proof. My girlfriend is a, a speech pathologist and she helps people that have uh, speech, you know, speech issues and stutters and that sort of thing. And she, every time I'm like, oh yeah, I can't, how do you do that? Like, how do you, how do you help people and stuff? And everything she does, it, because she's in the medical profession, is based on evidence, everything. She will not treat a person without evidence to back that the treatment that she's going to do works. And we should be the same when we optimize our code. We should optimize it with evidence, with facts that this thing actually needs to change or else we're doing our job wrong. So use Graphite or use New Relic or log shit to a file to get that evidence, right? You can't just assume or your system's down and you don't have that data available to you. You can't just assume that something's slow. You need to log it somehow. And you can get super complicated. I'll show you a couple ways, some tactics to, to get that data. But even if it's as simple as dumping out performance data to a log file, that's good enough. That's enough evidence to go and optimize. And by the way, nine out of 10 times, you have no idea where the bottlenecks are. Like I will admit to this, when we launched version two of TwitPic a couple of years ago. We had rebuilt the entire system. We had spent months coding on it. And we launched this brand new framework and all this new code. And it was very slow in the beginning. And I'm like, I, we had no logs, by the way. I'm like, I, I think I know where that problem is. It's probably this thing I wrote a while back. I didn't use the right data structure or something. And I went and optimized it and redeployed. And it was still slow. And so I did that over and over again. I tried to guess where the hotspots were. I tried to, to figure out and, and think my way through the problem instead of using evidence. And probably maybe 12 hours of wasted time later, realized, oh wait, we only used two of the database servers instead of all eight. It had nothing to do with my code, but I had spent 12 hours optimizing stuff that didn't even need to be optimized because I didn't have evidence. So how do we get evidence? Well. The easiest thing is you run XH profit production, you turn sampling on, you only capture it for a small amount of requests, maybe one out of every 300 requests. And you can capture this data and you can graph it or display it in XH GUI, XH GUI. And you can just constantly see, well, what's the performance of these different functions? By the way, you'll find things in here when you look at your code and you, and you actually can visually see the hotspots, you'll find hotspots. Even if your code is fast, you'll see, oh, this stuff takes a little bit longer than the other stuff. There's no such thing as uniformly slow code where everything just runs at the same slow speed and it's like a linear graph of you know everything you do is one millisecond. There are parts of your code that are slow and there are parts that are fast. And we run this so we know what parts are slow. And we keep it running in production because actually things in production have different performance characteristics than when you run it on your laptop. Maybe you have different hardware, or the network is at different speed, or things aren't running on local host. You need to run this in production and not just in your dev environment, your laptop, your staging environment, et cetera. Another great tool is this really awesome tool by NC called Skyline. And you basically feed it your data from Graphite and StatsD, and it looks for anomalies. So I won't go through and explain it. It's not, you know, you can look it up online. It's not my product, I didn't invent it. But, and I still have a screenshot from their website, by the way. Um, but you basically feed it your, your data from StatsD and it looks for these peaks and graphs of anomalies when things break and when things happen and it alerts you on them so you don't have to go and look at all million graphs that you might have, uh, especially if you're a bigger company. You can just get the anomalies that, that come through and you can either say, oh, this is you know, not true, this is disregard this, or you can say, holy crap, like something happened and I wouldn't have realized it otherwise. And I think what happens a lot with performance and with scaling is that there's like this domino effect that occurs. Like things are usually good fast enough until they're not. It's not like this, usually not this ramp up period where like you're like, oh, it's getting slower, it's getting slower, you have all this time. It's like, yeah, things are going pretty good. Oh crap, everything's down because there's a domino effect of things pile up and, and all it takes is just one area to, to go down or stop responding or have like a bad time upset and it takes everything else down. So it, Tools like this allow you to catch that, allow you to see where they, where it first occurred, where like the sort of source was, was patient zero, so to speak. So 
more on performance, like what are, in web apps, when we're building web apps, PHP apps, what are the scaling primitives? Like we're not talking really algorithms and data structures anymore. We're at a higher level of a, of a language or of a thing that we're building where that matters as much. It still matters, but it's not the end all be all because we build web apps that are like inherently different. They're more parallel, more concurrent than traditional computer science problems where we need to worry about the big O and, and that sort of stuff. Yes, we still need to worry about that, but they're not as important. There's different primitives. So what are they with web apps? I think it boils down to basically three things. Do it later, remember it, or denormalize it. Do it later means like do it in the background, do it somewhere else. If you're giving me an image to upload and I need to do all this crazy processing on it, why should I do it right there? I should do it in a thread if I'm using a language that has threading. If I'm using PHP, do it in a background queue. Use Rescue or Gearman or any of the thousand other queuing system, job systems that are out there. Do it later, don't do it right now. Remember it, use caching, use Redis or Memcache or again, the other million caches that exist out there, but remember it for later. That's another scaling primitive. And lastly, don't normalize it. Like the database does very much matter and not all, we can't always use normalized data, especially at when we need to scale up and we need better performance. Keep track of like view counters and, and different things you can denormalize out of the database. Use Redis or something in memory or just separate data and have it in multiple places to improve performance. But these three things will get you really far with scaling to the point where your code, the thing that your code does, the work that it does actually doesn't matter as much. It's more about where you do it, how you do it, if you use stale data, and where you put the work when you're done. The actual method of generating these things matters less. Your code doesn't matter as much. The other uh, thing that comes up in web apps a lot, and I put a slide for this because this is a huge pet peeve of mine, is saying timeouts, right? Like a lot of systems or libraries or whatever you use that connects to something else, the timeouts are usually insane, they're ridiculous. The same timeouts are almost never the default ones. They're, you download a library and it's some random company's API and they have a 10 second timeout on their API. Like that's insane, 10 seconds, well actually 10 seconds only three seconds longer than the average web request in 2012, but it's still a long time. Like if you're using timeouts that exist out there in the universe without checking them, without tweaking them and seeing what they are, you're probably gonna cause downtime in the future at any significant scale. Or if the API you're using goes down, they have a blip, they go down, well, their 10 second timeout's gonna take you down as well, it's nasty. Same timeouts are never the default timeouts. Also, use something like HAProxy between PHP and MySQL, because MySQL and PHP and the library that connects them, libMySQL, guess what, they have timeouts, and what are the timeouts that are not sane? The default ones, the timeouts in libMySQL are insane, they're like forever, if you run a query, the timeout is forever. And if you try to connect and you don't set a timeout, I think that it's like 10 seconds or something like that. The timeouts are insane. And the fact that a query that you can run from my seat or from PHP can just run forever, it's crazy, it's stupid. And there's no way to override that. You have to use a proxy in between like HA proxy where you can set a limit and you can say, hey, I never want a connection to take more than 250 milliseconds. And if it takes longer, it kills it. And you can deal with that in code, but at least you have the ability to. Otherwise, your code just sits there and spins. It's like, hey, my SQL, do you have a result yet? And like two years later, it's like, no, nah, still waiting, don't have anything. So use same timeouts. There's a really cool library by Netflix. It's called, I think it's pronounced Histrix, but maybe that's wrong. And there's a PHP port called Fistrix, something like that. But it basically what it does, is it's uh, this circuit breaker library. So it gives you two code paths where you can say, here's my failure code path and here's my sort of thing that I want to happen and, um, with a success code path. And you basically wrap things in it that you connect to an API or you connect to a service that's not within your process. So something over the network. And if it times out, if it fails, it runs your failure code path, but also remembers in the future for future requests that while well, this thing is probably down and here's the logic that you want to handle that gracefully instead of every web request trying and timing out, every web request trying and timing out, it remembers that, keeps that state in between requests. So I highly recommend that for building same timeouts everywhere. So just to recap, um, what's web app performance? What parts matter? I think that we need to zoom out on performance get away from the low level parts, 
stop optimizing as we code because when web, with web app performance, it's actually probably your systems and your infrastructure that need to be scaled or that you can improve with very uh, high, high returns with very low work. It's usually not your code and the code for web apps, the, the performance of it doesn't actually that matter that much. You can scale it out super easy. You add more servers, that's how you scale a PHP app. You add more servers, they all have PHP FPM running, you start up more workers, pretty easy to scale. It's, it's usually not PHP code that we need to worry about the performance of. Stop optimizing as you go, I already said that. The last piece is to monitor the hell out of everything. Everything we write should have so much monitoring on, around it that it's obnoxious. It should be another thing like writing unit tests. We write a ton of unit tests for our code. We should also write a ton of monitoring and build that in as a primitive. There should be monitoring endpoints on our apps that we just set up in point copyright or statsd2. We should put statsd everywhere and really get that evidence that we need to know what part of our apps are slow, what part of our apps are fast, what parts do we need to refactor. Without it, we're just guessing. And that's all I had. So I'm Stephen Cronin on Twitter. Thank you. Please follow me. Um, check out my book as well. Uh, and I want to thank Big Commerce for having having everyone here tonight. It's, we have food and it's pretty awesome, and I'm excited to go make some alcoholic hot chocolate in a second. And I also um, wanted to just throw it out there that we're moving to a new office next month, and we want to host a lot of meetups. So if you're part of any other group and you're like, hey, I'm in a Ruby group or a Golang group, I love Golang, so definitely if you're in a Golang group. Uh, we want to host way more meetups, like once a month. So if you have any other ideas of what meetups we can host, like let me know. Super excited about that. Um, yeah, that's it. Also, if you want to come write PHP Go and Ruby with me, let me know. We're hiring. Thanks, guys. Oh uh, yeah, any questions? I'm happy to answer. Anyone want to insult me because they hated my talk because they disagree fundamentally that performance doesn't matter? One of those examples you were talking about outside forces, what happened to us was FedEx. Remember to bring that one up? During Black Friday, the FedEx <laughs> failed. We didn't have the same timeouts. We didn't tell, tell the story. I don't, I don't know as well as you FedEx, did. FedEx failed for us. It actually took down Shopify as well and a lot of other retailers. It's basically real-time coding with FedEx. Their servers crapped out, and we didn't have the same timeouts or like to handle that properly. And so it backed up our whole shipping service all these requests that never came back, and it kind of actually crashed that, and so we were getting bad until FedEx fixed it, or we put something in place that would do it. So outside third-party stuff, you have to worry about that too. But it goes down to the same timeouts and districts as well. Yeah. Like I said, the default timeouts are always wrong. They're always <laughs> wrong. People are very optimistic about their timeouts. They should be in the hundreds of milliseconds and never in the full seconds and definitely not 10 seconds. It's like the old FTP clients when you connect up to something, it's like 120 second timeout and it freezes up your application or back in the day. Like, why would you need 120 seconds to actually connect to another server when that is done by light speed? So, 4K, 4K logo. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, cool, thank you. All right.